Okay, so let, let's start. Uh, the session name is Hands-on M2M. Um, we are going to focus on uh, Oracle embedded, Java embedded products and specifically on the latest release which aims small embedded devices and M2M. My name is uh, Ziv. Um, I'm engineering manager in Oracle, specifically uh, responsible for the development of the Java ME embedded product. Uh, we will talk about that in a second. Uh, with me, uh, Gonho. Gonho is uh, at the technical lead of, of the product uh, located in Korea. Okay, let's start. So what uh, we want to cover in the session, uh, a bit about the M2M market, uh, what it is, I'm not going to spend a lot of that. Uh, what are the barriers uh, to go into the market, technical barriers I'm talking here, specifically for device and application developers. Uh, then a bit about embedded Java, what it is. Um, it's not a one product, it's a family of products. Um, and then dive into the main uh, discussion. This is the Java ME embedded, the latest product we just released. Um, then go and see how you actually develop applications for the Java ME embedded. Uh, we have a very nice extra. Uh, we, we have uh, here, I'm uh, very honored to have uh, Sanvir, uh, product manager for Qualcomm. He's going to talk about uh, uh, how Qualcomm uh, sees uh, the M2M market and, and specifically Java. And we are going to have a demo on the board, so going to be exciting. So let's start. Uh, so M2A market, um, M2A market also called uh, the Internet of Things. Uh, it's a huge market. There are any number you pick from tens of billions and more uh, will go. You can see so many reports. Um, just to give you one of the... Uh, numbers, so by 2020, more data on the internet will be generated by devices than uh, human beings, than people. So it's huge amount of data is going to be generated. Uh, definitely the data is going to go somewhere and it's going to go to uh, cloud and, and data centers. Um, variety of markets, um, just to mention a few, uh, smart metering, smart grid, um, wireless modules uh, from companies like Centurion, Telit, uh, and, and others, uh, Sierra Wireless. All types of devices, your car, your car uh, itself usually have more than 10 to 20 small computers inside. Um, there's a little bit echo. And so, so where is uh, Java inside uh, all of that? Uh, so Java, even today, is in all of those devices. Um, just to name a few you know, uh, Amazon Kindle run uh, Java embedded. Um, partners, our partners, uh, uh, Centurion, uh, developing uh, wireless modules. Uh, run uses Java inside. Many smart grid companies uh, use Oracle Java for some of them of their uh, smart grid components. Um, of course, interactive TV in the US, all Blu-ray players, etc., etc. And so, what and, and what is uh, Oracle uh, interested in, in the whole market? So, we are interested in deploying. Uh, Java virtual machines into all of those uh, embedded devices and we would like to make sure that as much data as we can goes of course also to Oracle backend uh, data centers etc. So we will talk in uh, later on how we want to provide how we provide uh, today end-to-end -end device to data center solution. So what are the barriers uh, for developers when it comes to this huge market with different needs, etc.? So when I come to develop a, a, a device, and I'm interested in a second to hear how many of you are uh, coming from uh, companies developing devices or application, etc. So let's hear it in a second. 
but you want to pick up the, the, the CPU you want to use, um, and then you want to pick up which programming language you are going to deal with, and there are so many options, and then a real-time operating system, uh, usually with these low devices, um, and you have a set of, and, and that dot usually do not cover all your needs, so you need some more APIs. So there's, to build up a platform uh, uh, which is ready, let's say, for smart grid, there are so many components you have to pick along the way, um, so it makes your life very, very difficult. So what is uh, our suggestion? How we can we ease up your, your decision? So of course, uh, the solution we are aiming at is uh, a Java solution, where Java abstract, the hardware, the operating system, and a wide set of APIs uh, beyond all that. I just name a few. I want uh, location services, and I need SMS services, and I need um, web services, etc., etc. So all of that comes with the Java solution. So um, just a short survey, how many of you comes from a companies developing devices? Uh, okay, how many of you have any background with Java ME? Just a few. And, and I, think, I think the, the good news is that um, uh, Java is Java at the end, and the huge community of Java developers is very, very applicable for this field of use. So it opens up a lot of opportunity, I think, for all of you. So what, uh, when you t come up to uh, uh, develop your embedded system, what, what are your concerns? What, what you are trying to solve? Uh, so of course, security is huge concern. I, I'm developing a, a, you know, a smart meter. Uh, I don't want anyone to spy after my uh, energy consumption. I don't want anyone to, to change anything or, or um, the technology that I'm using, I, I want to make sure that it's been updated. I want to know the roadmap of the company. It should be a company that stays with me for years now. Um, everything is connected, uh, of course, short connectivity should be superb. Uh, I want to guarantee support for IP version 6 and anything that comes out. Um, I think that the rest of the stuff is, is obvious, uh, updatability. Uh, I want to be able to update my hardware in the field. It's a huge pain in the ass. Uh, you, you have some device. I have thousands of devices mounted, let's say, on, on a traffic light uh, system. How can I update the, 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 all those uh, devices in the field? So all of those issues are big, big concern when you come to develop uh, um, your embedded device, of course, time to market, etc. And um, I think uh, 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 all of us coming from the... Uh, Java uh, backgrounds, uh, myself, I have over 20 years experience in developing embedded applications, hardware and software, so I know the, 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 the difficulties very well. So coming to the Java uh, solution, Java is built ground up to be secured, uh, updatable uh, applications, uh, multi-application support, not trivial at all when you can't go in and, and deal with a small uh, real-time operating systems, uh, usually that's not supported. Huge community of uh, developers, uh, open sourcing, etc. So no question that Java brings a lot, a lot of value. Of course, it will not solve all the use cases. Um, just to name one, uh, real-time, Java, the Java we are talking about do not have real-time capabilities uh, built in it. So if you want to deal with, you have to break your application into a real-time part and, and, and part which is less sensitive to timing. Okay, so how, so, and, and the bottom line, it's a proven technology. Uh, the Java embedded is deployed today in billions of devices, starting from the lower end 
the Java card up to uh, phones, mobile phones, and, and, and additional devices. And the solution we are going to talk to about today is a proven solution, um, and we'll talk, see that in a second. So what is a, a Java Embedded? So Java Embedded is a family of product. It's not one product. Of course, one product cannot fit from tens of Ks to hundreds of megs of, of, of code and, and, and so on. So we have a family of products uh, at the high end. It's a Java SE embedded. Uh, there are a lot of sessions. Uh, you can go and hear about that. Um, going down, what we are going to focus today is the Java ME embedded, the new product we just released on September 25th. Uh, the product targets field of use such as smart metering, um, tracking, uh, vehicle tracking, uh, wireless models, etc., etc. And at the bottom, you have the Java card. Okay, any, if someone have any questions, just stop me uh, in the middle. Yes. And Java ME. Uh, so both, they, they are very different. They are based on a, a different virtual machine. Um, and, and just to, to, you can see the, 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 um, the, the profile of the system. When you go talk about Java ME, you talk about systems that do not have more usually than one meg or a few meg of memory. When you're talking about Java C, you, you need a lot more. Java C requires uh, usually a Linux or a Windows or some uh, multi-process um, uh, operating system uh, beneath it. If you're talking about Java ME, it can run on, on a very thin RTOS or even on a bare metal. Uh, so, so this influence uh, about everything, I think. So uh, the question is, do we need any operating since system uh, uh, b below the Java? Uh, we will see it in a, in a second, but uh, uh, in general, uh, you, you need very, very few operating system uh, APIs. Usually we do run on top of a real-time operating system, like VxWorks, if, if you have heard uh, WindRiver, VxWorks, so any, anything will work. Um, we can even run on a bare metal uh, without operating system, but it raises some more difficulties. Okay, so so we we mentioned we talked a bit about what is embedded Java, and now we dive in and see specifically what is a Java ME embedded. Um, so the good news is that it's a new product just released, uh, announced on September twenty fifth. Um, based on Java ME, same code that runs on mobile phones, uh, similar, let's say, call it similar code that runs on mobile phones. So it's not, uh, you, you can be assured that it's something which is well, well uh, um, debugged and, and with a lot, we have a lot of experience with it. Uh, by the way, the presentation eventually is going to be posted somewhere together with the other presentations. Okay? So what is uh, Java ME embedded? It's a framework for small devices. Uh, it leveraged the same technology that runs on, on mobile phones uh, for years now. It's extending uh, this technology. It's tuned for small headless devices. Uh, the spec, the main spec that uh, is being used is called IMPNG. Uh, the spec was developed by an M2M company named Centurion, Centurion Wireless, German company, one of the leaders. Um, and this spec is extended with a long list of optional GSRs. We will touch it later on. 
Um, we are talking about products that runs 24-7. It's not an application that user double clicks, manipulates, and, and exit. It's something that runs continuously, 24-7. Uh, so the quality should be very, very good. Um, secured by design, of course. Uh, all the goodies of Java easy to develop comes with uh, a selection of IDs. You can use NetBeans or Eclipse. We'll see it uh, later on. Uh, you can run multiple applications concurrently. Uh, each application is uh, in its own sandbox, of course. We have uh, new APIs that we are uh, promo uh, uh, introducing, uh, and we have a roadmap to make GSRs out of those APIs together with partners in the industry. Uh, just to name uh, some of the APIs, device access, this is the APIs that let you access all the embedded peripherals. We will see it uh, a bit later on. Uh, logging APIs, uh, headless application management systems. You don't have any visual with this release, so you need a way to manage the applications, etc. It's a platform independent as so with all Java, um, and it's very well fit the market of wireless uh, devices, wireless M2M devices. And we have a very aggressive roadmap. Uh, we will see the roadmap in a second. Um, and you can have a look at the next year and, and know what we are going to offer them. So what, uh, how the stack uh, looks like, uh, going down uh, to the details. So this is um, starting bottom up. Uh, of course, we, we provide um, an emulation that runs on top of uh, Windows. Um, we will show you very soon. We are going to introduce evaluation board. You will, will be able to purchase the board uh, from any vendor in the in the uh, internet, and then download the software we provide you and run your application on the board. Uh, we will see it uh, uh, later on. Uh, and of course, as time goes by, we are going to provide you more and more alternatives uh, for, for more developer platforms. This is uh, also why uh, Sanvir from Qualcomm is here and is going to uh, tell you a little bit more about our plans. Um, so there's the porting layer that abstract all the, the, the virtual machine. Then we have the virtual machine, which is called the CLDC, uh, Connected Limited Device Configuration. And on top of that, the list of APIs we provide. You can see how, how uh, uh, wide it is. And we have a long list of additional JSONs that we will be introducing starting from uh, accessing peripherals to application management. Um, IMPNG is the base which defines what is an application and life cycle. File system management, SMS, location, web services, cryptologic, XML, and more. Uh, on top of all of that, we provide a set of uh, high-level, um, let's call it SDKs, starting from application management system, we give you a command line interface. Uh, usually that's what uh, is being given to manage uh, headless devices. You, a technician can connect, it has a command line interface, it can configure the system. Uh, we give an easy way for device manufacturers to extend the system. They can add their own APIs uh, and bundle it and provide it to their customers to, to develop applications. Okay, any questions on uh, on this slide or any slide uh, mentioned before? Yep. Okay, very very good point. So uh, the question is uh, about OSGI. Uh, Java ME actually covers two. It's a bit confusing because it covers two virtual machines. Uh, one is called CLDC, and the the other one is CDC. A uh, CLDC cannot run uh, OSGI. Um, it needs uh, class loaders and additional functionality, which is not available here. But CDC, it's the higher profile, do provides, um, can run OSGI, yes. So 
so how many mobile phones okay so mobile so java me um so java me is already deployed in all in in more many of let's call it feature phones today uh, this profile specifically is deployed in mainly in feature phones uh, what we are talking here is is uh, an evolution of that we are uh, targeting the embedded market okay so it's a variant of java me which is uh, specifically tuned for the embedded market not for phones yes Yes. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Uh, trying to go back to this. <laughs> okay. So so here. So dear. Exactly, exactly. Customer have to make the choice based on the footprint, based on the device. Of course, you cannot fit a 50K device. You will not fit uh, Java IC. So you have, you have to pick the device according to your... Um, those devices are much more cost sensitive. Those are less cost sensitive, etc. And we and and the aim when we go to the roadmap slide, you will see that one of our goals is to uh, unify the platforms as much as we can to provide the same API, the same language across all uh, variants. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so just this, just repeating again the list of uh, JSRs and APIs uh, that Java ME Embedded provides. Uh, and now we try to go a bit and, and, and give you a short overview. I want you to pause me when you want to double click on something. So this is uh, how the command line interface looks like. I will show you it live later on the board. Um, you connect to the board, and you can do some simple management functionalities. You can install applications, update um, interactively. Uh, you can connect it over a serial line. You can connect it over TCP IP. Uh, device uh, manufacturer can extend it to any interface they have in mind. Um, you can change configuration files from remote. You don't have to be by the box to change the configuration files. Uh, the set of uh, commands available with the CLI is extendable. So usually we expect the device manufacturers to come up and add their own uh, commands, uh, if they like, of course. Um, development uh, tools. So we have a selection of uh, NetBeans and Eclipse. The SDK that we provide is called ME SDK. Uh, I will give you the links at the end of the presentation. It works on both uh, tools. Uh, so the tooling, uh, you're familiar, of course, with the NetBeans, I guess, or uh, uh, Eclipse. It gives you a nice IDE with on-device debugging. You can device applications running either on emulator or on your device itself. Uh, we will see it later. Um, and I will show you a bit about the emulation uh, we are doing. So um, emulation, uh, we are trying to emulate the device peripherals. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, uh, common embedded peripherals, uh, starting from general purpose I.O. I will mention in a second what it means. Um, so we have a list of peripherals. And um, here you can see some of the emulations. I, I will go and briefly discuss each one of them later. And the nice thing is also we provide a tool that lets you create your own custom emulation, emulator. So let's say you are a, uh, a device manufacturer, you have your own device, and you want to give your developers an emulator that 
uh, uh, emulates the specific set of peripherals you selected to have on your device. You can create a configuration here, uh, a new skin that matches your specific requirements. I have three general purpose pins. I have three buses, I4C buses. These are the names. This is the configuration. And, and you give a very precise emulation to your customers. Uh, when you can even take it uh, further, you can add your own custom emulation in code. You can code how exactly each pin behaves, if you like, and provide that as part of the emulation you give your developers. And at the end, of course, you, you take this uh, um, uh, configuration of your new device and you can distribute it to your developers uh, to develop their applications on their PCs before they deploy it on, on the device. And all this is released and, and you can download it today, yes. So, um, so the question is about performance. Yeah. Um, so, I, okay, it, it's a good, it, it depends how you measure the performance, but uh, I think that CLDC is very capable. Usually, um, usually you, you, you would select a higher end CPU. If you have a higher end CPU uh, and it comes usually with more memory, you will also select a higher end operating Java virtual machine. Um, so uh, it, it's hard to compare. So this, this is what you would select a lower end virtual machine, a CLDC, if your hardware cannot usually run a higher end virtual machine, Java virtual machine. But uh, CLDC is very capable. Uh, Sunspot is is um, Sunspot is an Oracle Labs uh, product. It's a hardware and software uh, product. It runs a subset of what you see here. It's a subset of that. Uh, what what for uh, instance uh, did you want to implement and had issues with? Uh, can you give example? Because Okay, so, so Sunspot is a different uh, product with uh, a different set of APIs. Uh, no, 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 CLDC only. CLDC. Yeah. Uh, to to my understanding, it's only CLDC and then proprietary APIs without the additional profiles we show here. Um, what we are showing here, and you will see the roadmap coming up, it's a much more advanced um, set of APIs and framework. So let's uh, let, let's go in and, and see and try to summarize what we talked until now, and and try to show you now how it really works. So um, embedded market is exploding. Uh, Internet of Things uh, is uh, very hot buzzwords. Um, um, we are looking at more and more devices, devices that needs to run and de be deployed for years, needs to run 24 seven. They are becoming much more capable. They are connected. So you need a very smarter SDK, smarter language, more capabilities uh, from the, the, the platform to the SDK and, and so on. And Java uh, Embedded is the perfect solution that we think uh, uh, we position for this market. Uh, we mentioned before uh, why we think so. Or Java is strategic to Oracle. We, uh, if you think uh, uh, when was the last 
you know, when we we originally came from Sun Microsystem, if you think go back and think uh, how much Sun invested in Java, and we see how much more Oracle now invest in new JSRs, new releases. Uh, I think it's amazing. So the commitment of Oracle is huge, and uh, we are very happy about that. A bit about the roadmap. So we, uh, I mentioned before, when you go in and select uh, uh, your technology, you want to make sure that there is a roadmap. Someone is going to take this product and, and, and grow it with you. Uh, so we, we started with uh, releasing the Java ME Embedded 3.2 together with the SDK and emulation. So this is done. Um, Next release of this product is 3.3, uh, is enhancements, more APIs supporting more hardware peripherals uh, going and, and trying to fit into smaller devices, uh, improving the tooling, uh, providing you with more plat embedded platforms, uh, hardware platform to work with. Um, you can see what's happening in, in the rest of, of the embedded field. We are going to introduce SE Embedded 8, um, which uh, additional embedded profiles. And right after, the, after that, we are going to have a major new release of the MB Embedded. Um, new JSRs. Uh, I don't know if any of you were in CLDC 7 uh, uh, session, which was just before. Uh, new alignment of the language, alignment of APIs, more alignment between uh, Java ME and Java SE. So we are trying to utilize and, and, and the, the, the big community of developers we are having and give them something which is familiar and, and consistent across all platforms. Okay, so we, we talked a lot, and now we want to see some more how actually it's going to work. So just for the talk, uh, let's assume we have a, a customer project. Someone just came to us and told us, guys, we, you, you need to come and build a container tracking uh, device and, and the applications that come with that. And let's see some common requirements that you expect to be introduced. So I want to uh, track the location and the condition of the uh, contain my container. Um, I want to know if someone is trying to mess me with the container, tries to open it while it's on the way. Uh, I want to monitor some sensors like uh, temperature uh, to see if some something is getting wrong. Um, I don't want to commit to a specific uh, device vendor. I want to develop my application in a way that uh, later on I can you know, choose between multiple vendors and make sure I get the best uh, value from, I can lower the price of, 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 uh, of my device. So I want to make sure that I'm not locked with, to a specific vendor here. I want to be able to remotely administrate uh, uh, the devices over a cellular network. Um, and of course, like all projects, it's critical to have it very quickly. I want it tomorrow. Um, so how can, I, how can I manage all these requirements? Uh, I need a multi-platform, all these complex developments and, and everything in a short time. And, and guess what? My, our answer is, is Java, of course and uh, specifically the Java ME embedded. Let's see, let's try to uh, get and understand how we can um, comply with the requirements above. So we, we want to have uh, a tamper detection. We want to have to know when someone opens the container. So I have some switch and the switch is connected to something which is called general purpose I.O. I, I will show you in a second what it means. And I want to detect, my software to detect very easily when it's been triggered. And then I, I want to measure also the temperature. Uh, so I want to pull it every, 
some time, a few minutes, let's say. So I have some analog uh, reading. And it's connected to, to some analog to digital. And at the end, I want to read it uh, from my software. Um, and I need some uh, time tagging for my report. So I, I will have a real-time clock uh, on the device. And you know, by the way, Oracle didn't provide me with uh, a real-time clock uh, uh, API. So I will have to develop my own Java driver for that. So let's see uh, how we do that. And I need to save uh, the configuration uh, somewhere. So I selected to do it on, on uh, a memory, non-volatile memory, uh, very common in cheap devices. It is called Iskra Pirom. Uh, and that is uh, accessed with uh, a bus called I2C. We will see it in a second. And I need remote management. Um, so just for the sake of the simplicity of, of the demo, uh, we selected to implement a very, very small footprint embedded web server on the device. Uh, we will see it in, in a moment. I'm not claiming that all our selection is commercial grade. And this is what you should do. But uh, it serves very well the, the uh, demo and, and the samples that I'm going to show. So um, just to review, I want to have a temperature sensor, a, a tamper detection. I have a real-time clock. I want to save my information somewhere. And I want to report and be able to manage everything from remotely. So let's see how we going to do it and how easy it is to implement it. So we start with um, the application itself. So what is an application in Embedded? So what it looks like. So uh, uh, not many of you knows, uh, I see MIDP and Java ME, but um, uh, the life cycle is very simple. I'm going to show you in a second. Um, we have a headless management system. I'm going to show you how we deploy applications to the device, how easy it is. Um, security model, it's the same security that runs on phone, mobile phones. Uh, application runs in, in a sandbox. APIs are protected. We are not giving any API access to all, uh, any application access to all APIs. Uh, device manufacturer can select the level of uh, security they want. You have to sign your application with the right security to be able to access. Um, we have some embedded uh, specific features uh, for the applications. For, for example, I want to, when I reset the device, I want a set of applications to be started automatically. Uh, I want to control even the order of the launch of those applications. I want this application first and that one right after that. And I want to be, uh, if application crash, maybe I want to mark uh, my application to be restarted automatically. So there are a set of specific uh, embedded uh, uh, features. If you want to run uh, the device 24 seven, you need to comply with that. So this is how uh, application life cycle looks like. Uh, application starts with a start application. You can pause your application, for example, if device uh, goes to sleep and, and save some power. And when you sh before uh, shutting down your application, you, you get notified. A very simple uh, life cycle uh, and, and similar to what works on mobile phones. Very good question. How do I deploy updates? So, um, so it is built in into the, the there are protocols built in into the platform, usually on top of uh, HTTP, but you can do it on, in other ways as, as well. Um, I will show you an example how we do it from the IDE, uh, again, over the air. It, same, same thing like runs on mobile phones, right? On mobile phones, you also need to deploy application, update them over the air. So kind of the same mechanism. Logging, um, logging is another facility uh, required by developers. Uh, so we borrowed a subset of Java SE, Java UT logging. Uh, I guess most of you are familiar with that. Uh, 
so you can update uh, dynamically the level of information, detail, detail level of information you want to see. Uh, you can have several loggers. You can filter out uh, messages you don't want to see. Uh, you can have handlers that captures the, the logs. Let's see, I want all the severe messages to go to my backend uh, management system as alerts. Something went bad. All the rest I just capture locally and do something with it. So uh, as a developer, you have a very flexible uh, uh, mechanism to work with. Um, so this is the API we provide. I think I can skip it unless anyone have questions, just uh, let me know. So let, let, let's see what uh, the embedded peripherals uh, looks like. So general purpose I.O. are mapped to hardware pins on the device. Uh, the device, the chip has uh, pins connected. So these are the general purpose I.O. You, they are controllable from software. You can configure them as input and uh, as output. Um, you can register a Java listener and tell, please call this function when you have a change. Uh, of course, you can trigger and turn, and, and turn on and off. You can connect it to LED. You can connect it to any other devices. In our case, uh, in the demo, you will see how we connected to the tamper switch. So, uh, so the simple code in our case, um, we have a switch. We want to get notified when switch is changed. So we give you an API. You ask, give me a, a handle to the pin, to the tamper pin. You get a handle. You set up a listener in a, in a few codes of line. Uh, uh, you can do whatever you like with the. You get notified and you can add your logic here. Another use case, uh, I have a temperature. In this, in this case, uh, it's not a specific pin. Uh, you can gather a few pins together and, and, and treat them as one integer value. Uh, we call it a port in hardware uh, language. Uh, so if you want to read the temperature, you just get an access again to the port and you just read the value. So, so easy. It's an integer value. And uh, just a bit uh, mainly interesting uh, guys who, who do more device, uh, the device side. It's very configurable on the device side. Uh, you want, if you want to map hardware pins into Java Word, you just define it in a configuration file. I want to map pin number five to Java. Uh, it's going to be an input pin. Uh, I'm going to call it button two and, and just reset your device and, and next time you can access from Java to button two and, and manage. Next uh, peripherals I want to uh, uh, mention is, is I2. It's a bus, uh, very low-end bus, uh, very cheap. It's a two-wire interface. One line goes to data, one line goes to clock. A master-slave, uh, the CPU initiate all transactions. Um, again, all APIs are, are protected with uh, only if you have sufficient uh, access level, you can access them. So you, 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 if not any application can access the drivers, examples of uh, usage, uh, peripherals that are usually connected to I2C is non-volatile memory like I2C PROM, ADC is uh, uh, analog to digital converter, and exp IO expanders, you can plug in more in uh, general purpose IOs, etc., etc. So very common device, uh, if you go to companies that developing wireless modules, you will find those uh, interfaces everywhere. Uh, so how do we use it in Java? Again, very, very easy. Give me a handle for uh, the slave device with this name. Uh, you get the handle. Uh, in this case, uh, the eScore PROM has addressing within the chip. 
So the, the, the function uh, gets an address within the memory space of the E squared PROM and gets the length of data you want to read. We, we call this function, it's, it, it, impl it does two things uh, in one function, go to a specific memory location inside the EEPROM and then read from there. So easy. If you have a C interface, uh, uh, I don't know how many of you done embedded programming in the past, believe me, it, it's not even close to this uh, uh, much harder uh, and much pro less protective as a developer. Memory mapped I.O. Uh, sounds a bit uh, strange for Java developers, but I want to map certain areas in the native memory of the device. I want them to be accessible to Java. Sounds a bit uh, strange uh, to Java developers, but usually the main use case is that um, I have a device which, you know, Oracle didn't provide a driver. I have to develop my own driver and I want to do it in Java. So I need to access the device registers from Java. And to do it, I need to be able to access native memory. This is uh, uh, one of the main use cases for the API. So I, I will not give you any uh, access to any address. It's not like in C. Just set the address and write to it. Uh, in the configuration files, you specifically expose only the regions you want Java to be able to access. Uh, so I limit the access. Um, I can even abstract the access, so it doesn't matter exactly where the device is mapped in memory. If I have few devices, and, and uh, in one device the real-time clock is mapped into this address space, and the other one it's others, different address space, I don't care. Everything is abstracted in Java. Um, I will show you later. Again, I can have a listener tell me when uh, something changed. Um, I will let only trusted application access my APIs uh, and I can develop simple Java drivers. Again, it will not, it doesn't cover and not claiming to cover all the use cases. Main use case which is not covered is real-time use cases, but uh, other use cases which do not require real-time, uh, Java is a perfect fit for that. So an example, uh, I have the real-time clock. Um, uh, so I, I get a handle to the real-time clock uh, memory block, and then I, I get a handle to the specific registers uh, of the real-time clock. Um, and once I get the registers, I can go on and read their value and, and make whatever I want to make. Uh, this is just an example of how I read the, the date. It, and it's a real example. It's not something we made up. Questions about that? Yeah, so this is uh, how we protect from hacking uh, the system. So uh, it's a very, very good question, you know, because uh, uh, those devices needs end-to-end -end security. And end-to-end -end means uh, starting from a physical security, you need to know if someone opened the cover of the device, this is the first, you know, security line, uh, and you have a similar temper anti-tempering, uh, and usually uh, you have chips where you can trigger even erasion, erase all the memory and, and do things like that. If someone opened the device, the cover, uh, uh, without authorization, um, and the code should be signed. Uh, so if you don't have, you know, the encryption, the, the, the signature, the key, you cannot, if you, even if you are a hacker, you cannot change 
the code or introduce your own application because the, 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 we will not try an application which are not signed. Um, and the protocols, external protocols, everything has to be, of course, encrypted. Uh, and when we work with companies from smart energy, uh, of course, uh, for example, or healthcare, uh, nobody wants his health data to be exposed to anyone. So uh, definitely this is inherent in our design, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, we have a JSR for cryptology and we support uh, SSL, you can support uh, uh, AES and other cryptology uh, algorithms, yes. So this is just an example uh, on the device uh, OEM side. Uh, how would you extend and expose more memory regions? So you would define a memory region, you, you, you give it a name, you give it an ID. Um, do you want to expose um, events, uh, listeners? Uh, then you, you expose uh, registers, uh, you map it to an address. Uh, you, you say which type of data is that, is it an integer, bytes, uh, whatever, what is what is the, the memory length, the word length uh, you support. And so everything is configurable, you don't have to recode. Uh, if it's a supported platform, you don't have to recode, you just extend it with a configuration file. So, uh, and, and to comply with the last uh, example, uh, we have created here a very simple uh, web server. Uh, it's not covering the full spec, but it's a very, very uh, small footprint. Actually, it's a 40K. Uh, I will show you how it works. It was, the work was done by uh, Gunho's team, uh, engineering, Oracle Engineering Services. It was done both for our purposes and for our customers. Um, so using that, you can just use any um, standard-based UI framework. In our case, we selected jQuery Mobile and we created some remote management. I will show you it in a second. Yeah, uh, not, not, <laughs> or, 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 yeah. So unfortunately, uh, you know, I'm showing it on the iPad and it's not running Java, so we had to run something else. <laughs> so ju just to show you a bit how the web server and how easy it is to connect with Java. Um, so. If you want to extend and have a listener with Java, you just add a URL. I want to get uh, information about the peripherals, and this is my handler. Um, the implementation of the handler, when URL is accessed, you go to the handler, uh, you get a JSON data, you, you de decrypt, the, not decrypt, um, you pass the data, uh, you and do something uh, make sense out of it. So it's very easy, very short. On the JavaScript side, you just have an AJAX call that access your Java uh, web server and, and do something with it. So uh, very easy to extend. Um, so if talking about CLDC, so this is CLDC, very easy to extend it. Uh, and you know, you know, I'm sure that you will come up with much smarter uh, ideas than, than we had here for the demo. Which two devices? Of course, uh, if you go to the uh, demo ground, uh, we have some uh, nice demos. Uh, we have three nice demos. Uh, one of them is uh, showing a smart grid use case, we have a device, actually it's this uh, device, which is a con uses uh, a Zigbee uh, communication and operating uh, some standard-based Zigbee switches. Uh, it can talk to another board as well. And we have another demo showing uh, a servo control. Uh, 
And we have another demo, which is uh, like automated car, small car that goes around and, and turns, uh, it, it detects uh, when it hits the walls before it hits something and then turns. So we have nice demos. Uh, I encourage you to go on. I will also refer you to uh, more sessions, relevant sessions. Okay, so uh, so we want um, now to see. So it was nice to see it on slides. Let's see how it, we really work with the IDE, uh, how we deploy it on the emulator, um, and later also how it runs on the board. Okay, so I think this is the time to show you the device. So this is uh, the device, uh, it, it has uh, ST micro, it, the chipset is from ST micro, the motherboard itself comes from Kyle, Kyle is ARM uh, uh, daughter company, uh, the CPU is an ARM Cortex-M processor, I don't know if you are familiar with that, it's a very very low end uh, processor, if you compare it to the Sunspot, it's even much, much lower end uh, and a cheaper. Uh, it's a very new architecture from uh, ARM. Actually, this is what they position as the main architecture for low end uh, Internet of Things. Uh, yes, 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 yes. ARM um, Cortex M, it's a family, it's an architecture. Uh, specifically, the chipset here is uh, uh, coming from ST Micro, so one of the big companies. So, uh, uh, Gonho just uh, reset the, the device. Uh, so, device is up and running. And uh, uh, if you had the bionic eyes, maybe you can read here that uh, it's ready, <laughs> ready to be used. Uh, <laughs> so, um, let's switch to my. We'll have to switch uh, between the, the views. So you can see down here that uh, the device was detected. The device is ready to be used. Uh, so how, how did I did the magic? Uh, in the IDE, I have an add device button. I just type in the IP address of the device uh, and it's con immediately connecting to the device. Uh, I, I do it only once and then it pulls if the communication uh, breaks uh, it will try to pull again and when the device comes to life again it will detect it like you saw here and, and you can see a pop-up that's telling you that connection is resumed. No, uh, actually not. It's a, it's a um, uh, actually, okay, let me talk about the setup. So, the <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so the setup here is number one, number two. Too many buttons on, on the switch. <laughs> so, the setup is. Uh, we have on, on the device um, only two wires, as you see. One of them is uh, a USB just for power, and the other one is Ethernet. Ethernet, yes. So in our case, it's uh, an Ethernet connection. Uh, when we go to real deployments, it's probably going to be cellular connection like uh, we'll see with Qualcomm device. Um, so I have Ethernet connection connected to my laptop as well. And we will see my iPad is connecting over cellular uh, network. We have an access point here. The operating system is a real-time operating system. Uh, sp specifically here, it's, uh, it's one coming from uh, Express Logic. It is called ThreadX. Uh, very popular operating system. So th those operating system are ju just to give you the sense, the whole operating system is something like tens of Ks, like 30K. Yeah, so it's very, very limited, gives you 
thread synchronization, some uh, things like that. Okay, so the, the, this is pretty much what we need from the platform. Okay, so going back. Yes. TCP IP stack supporting IP version 4, IP version 6. So this is the IDE. Uh, we saw that um, it's uh, uh, connected. And now, um, okay, so I think uh, actually we wanted to show on, on the emulator, not on the device press, right? So, <laughs> sorry for that. So um, I will, so how do I select uh, which platform I want to uh, uh, demonstrate? I just go to the configuration and select from the list of platforms I have. Um, and instead of selecting the external device, I select the emulator device. And then when I start running, Is it running already? Okay, I left it running from my test. So when I start running, um, it will open up the device simulator. This is the guy. Um, you can see the list of applications I have on the device. I can deploy more applications. Uh, I can stop and start them. I can, this is an application management system. Uh, I can see the state of the peripherals. Um, I can emulate changes. I will show you it. I can inject events. So the whole uh, idea previously uh, so one of the goals was uh, to show you how uh, we remotely manage the device. So I open the website. Two? Yes. Ah, okay. <laughs> Okay, so that's connected uh, to the device. So I can open up, so running on the emulator, of it's, um, I need to use the local host, right? So this is the web, the web interface. So you can see we built a web interface with jQuery mobile. Uh, you, you, we have here, we hooked up the events from the switch and the temperature. Um, so if I now change and inject event, I now open the door, uh, I pull every few seconds uh, on the web interface and you can see that the status was changed. This is just to show you um, how it all connects together. Also implemented here, sorry, something like a log. You want to send a log to your uh, backend. Um, we added some color coding for alerts. So you can do uh, any, any crazy idea you have in mind. Um, you want to ha have some, a graph showing you what is the, the, the status of the temperature in your box. So any crazy idea, of course, anything is, is possible. Uh, with HTML5 and, and web server and Java technology on the box, I think uh, everything is possible. So this is about uh, the emulator. You can debug. Um, last thing I want to show you about the emulator um, is, is what we have here. Um, so the minute you install the Java ME SDK, it gives you additional menu. Uh, where you can um, create your own custom devices. Um, you have a device uh, selector. You have a bunch of more 
capabilities. I'm mean, not going to that, but everything is released. You can just download it and play and, and do something uh, meaningful. Okay, at this point, if uh, no, it, yeah. Yes. OS X. Good point to my, no, I, I, I need to go back and give you an answer. Okay, so one, uh, one of the good uh, points is that at the end we also give you a, a link to a forum, developer forum, so you can post uh, questions on the forum and we'll be happy to answer anything. You can also take my uh, name card and be happy to help. Any other question before we go to the next? Uh... Okay, so I think before we go into the device and show, yeah. I cannot hear. No, it says released, 7.2, standard release. Yeah, on the nightly build we have more capabilities, but you know, I don't want to sh show you half-baked uh, stuff. So this is released, yes. Okay, so before we go to the device and uh, I show you a little bit how the same application we, we developed here runs also on the device, uh, how we mimic the emulation on real switches, real buttons on the device and everything works completely the same. Um, before we do uh, this magic, I'm uh, very happy uh, to give a, a Sanvir the opportunity to show. Yeah. Can we switch to uh, this mic, please? You're, you're stepping on my. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Ziv. Um, my name is Sanvir Gujral. I'm a product manager in, at Qualcomm. And uh, I just and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to just talk about our development platform that we are going to be um, making available fairly soon uh, using the entire the, the Java platform that Ziv just talked about. So um, the whole idea, if you don't know about or about uh, Qualcomm, let me just kind of give you a little bit. I'm, I'm sure most of you have heard of Qualcomm. It's the largest supply of mobile uh, chipsets in the world. Uh, you probably majority of the phones out there, or a large majority of them use Qualcomm chipsets. And, um, and in, we've been doing this for many, many years. And one of the things that we've started looking at is in the M2M space, specifically, the ability to control these applications, like the one that uh, Ziv just showed and will show after I'm done, uh, over the air, over a cellular network is probably really what makes an M2M application tick. You know, a tracking application that needs an Ethernet cable to do it all the time probably isn't going to track too far. So um, I, the idea at Qualcomm in order to be able to uh, run these things on, on cellular chipsets is to be able to leverage the application processor that exists on our cellular chipsets. So if you look at uh, your, your cell phone, smartphone, even going back to the old uh, the feature phone days, there's a fairly powerful processor in there, an ARM processor usually, that you could leverage to run this entire Java, Java stack on. And that's precisely what this particular platform, which we call Orion, uh, allows you to do. It's got a um, ARM 926 on this one, but uh, you know we have different ones that different chipsets that support different uh, uh, ARM processors at varying levels of um, capability. But, you know, but on this particular one, it's it's a it's ARM 926, and the the idea was to provide an, a development platform very similar to this one, but, but except with how, with full uh, cellular capability. And this one actually has Wi-Fi and GPS as well, so you could actually build that entire tracking application uh, self-contained on something like this. Uh, the the other big difference is Qualcomm has always provided a an application a development platform in the form of a phone to traditional phone uh, phone developers. So if you were developing a Rue application or a, or a Java ME application or Android or whatever it might be, uh, you know, initially we provide some sort of a phone that we call a FFA or a form factor accurate telephone that you can actually build your applications on. The problem with those is that they did not have access to the real world interfaces like the GPIOs and the I squared C's, uh, SPIs, et cetera, some of the interfaces that uh, Ziv talked about earlier. 
And so this particular platform actually gives you physical hard hardware access to all of those pins and interfaces that exist on the modem chipset. Uh, and, and of course, it, it has a 3G module in there as well. The, uh, the other reason to use a module, by the way, Actually, why don't I move to the next one over here? So, if you look at um, that's the actual modem right there. That, that's the, the kind of the heart of the whole thing. And if you actually can, actually, it's got an adapter board. And if you look at the adapter board, that's what it looks like on the inside. And um, if you, the rest of it, it looks like a really large board, but the rest of it is really to be able to break out all the pins, etc., to be able to access everything. But the entire brains of it is basically right inside that one chip, and the memory is in there as well. So essentially, once you have developed an application on this board, you can optimize it. And you know, if you don't need 40 GPIOs, you just and oh, by the way, all the GPIOs come out on these little pins over here. Uh, you, you can just take out the ones you need and just make a very very small device that you could make a, a pillbox tracker or whatever you wanted to make, or, or a smart meter, etc. And and then you, of course, if you don't need GPS, you don't. Need, there, there's a GPS um, RF transceiver in here as well that you don't necessarily need. You don't need a Wi-Fi. You get rid of that chip, etc. So you know it, it allows you to the the board itself allows you to do a lot of things. But then eventually, when you actually deploy deploy a real application, you can optimize it down uh, significantly. So just some details on what you know, specific interfaces we have available on this particular board. There's a spy that's a serial peripheral interconnect uh, similar to I squared C, uh, and I and I believe <coughs> that that is fully supported in the. In, in the uh, Java ME as well. Um, I squared C, you, you know, some more details about the fact that you can you can configure it to various uh, voltage levels, uh, 1.8 or 3.3. You know, fairly easy to configure just by changing a jumper on the on the port. We also built in a there's a analog to digital converter on the chipset itself. Uh, I reference this QSC 6270, which is a Qualcomm chip that has uh, that's used on this particular board. Um, it has it has one ADC and then we put a, a multiplexer outside it so you can actually hook up eight analog signals to it and be able to read uh, read the data and use and you don't have to actually use an external ADC. The whole idea behind all of this is is cost optimization, right? We want there's a lot of capability in the chip and we want to expose as much of it as possible uh, from from Java and so that eventually you end up with a very very cost optimized low cost uh, device. And it has. We, we are, on the board itself, we put a bunch of, of five LEDs so you can actually play with them and do different things. You don't have to use external devices to do all that. Uh, there's a micro USB slot. There's an SD card slot. USIM, that's where the SIM card would go in. Uh, it has four DB9 connectors. Um, they have like the RS-232 connectors, if, if you've seen them. And one of them is actually hardwired to a UART. The others are available. Uh, various GPIOs can come out on those. So you can kind of hard code your own protocol and, and device interface if you really want it. It's got a JTAG uh, in-circuit emulator connection as well, so you can actually do device-level debugging. We don't expect Java developers to ever actually need, have to need that. It's more for the develop, developers of the board itself uh, more than anything else. The other point over here, it's got a very flexible power supply, so it actually has a, if I actually went back, uh, there's a space for a battery right there, and you can actually stick a battery in there. And what that allows you to do is effectively, you don't even have to plug in power. It, you can use as a, you know, you can put an AC adapter right there. You could use that, but uh, and to charge it, etc. But at the end of the day, you can actually take this thing, stick it in the backpack, and walk around with it. Sorry, you had a question. So we have actually there's there's uh, I believe that 25 GPIOs actually all together, but. Many of them, so if, for example, on these LED, the LEDs are right about over there. They're also available as a, as a uh, header over there, and there's their jumpers. So if you didn't want to use the LED, you can just take the jumper out and then just have access directly to the GPIO. Exactly. Yeah. So, so as you probably are aware, you have the sleep mode on your phones, right? So which basically essentially turns off anything that radiates power, which is what takes a lot of uh, takes the power up. So you can put it in the sleep mode, 
And once it does, then it's, it's running in a very, very low power environment. I don't have the exact the power numbers on it, but one of the things that Qualcomm prides itself on on its modem chipsets, and it's probably the leader in, in that space, is power optimization. So by definition, our, our chipsets run at, at very, very low power. Now, would it compare to a standalone PIC microcontroller? Probably not, right? But that, that's a completely different space. Yeah. The upper. Um, it, well, you know, we, we can you can put any size battery you want on here. I think this one we use a 27 milliamp hour uh, battery on it, but it completely dependent on that. So if you know a typical uh, chipset, and I don't want to quote exact numbers without actually you know, having, having them in front of me because I don't want to be <laughs> held for them later on. But, you know, it's, it's not, if, if you look at, at a smartphone, depending on what all you're running on it, whether you have GPS turned on or off, you know, it could be anywhere from hours to days, right? And in this situation, we, we can actively put it into sleep mode when you're not doing anything other than just, so you just wake it up when you need to do send something over the, over the 3G network, and then it's just sitting in the sleep mode all the rest of the time. So it could, it could be days, in the order of days, yeah, many days. As far as the sensors that are built into the board itself, there's an accelerometer. Uh, again, it, it's, it's hooked up. You actually can configure it to use the SPI or the I2C again by configuring jumpers on there. And, or you can uh, just completely ignore that and just use the GPIO directly. But the accelerometer actually uses a SPI interface or the I2C to, to configure it, and then it will generate interrupts based on uh, conditions that you set on GPIOs. So you could trigger other uh, events, other electronics with it. It's got a built-in light sensor. It's got a built-in temperature sensor. And again, all of the all the GPIOs that are used for those are accessible for other needs as well. If you don't want to use that particular thing, the idea was to give you a board that you can just take out of the box and start doing something with immediately without having to do any soldering or anything like that. Sure. Yes. Yeah. The whole idea is you develop it, and then you you could deploy it, but obviously it's not in the cheapest and smallest form factor that you could get eventually. Our well, we have a lot, we have a lot of this. We're just making this available as a development platform to our OEMs, and many of them would be making devices like that. And the, the idea is also to encourage the the ecosystem and the developer base to. Once they've deployed this, then there'll be, you can just give your, your schematics, or, which will be very easy to pare down, because you'll make all these schematics available. You just say, I, I don't need this line, I don't need this line, I don't need this line. And you could take it to any device, OEM or ODM, to re redeploy it for you. I, I don't, we haven't announced pricing, but it is, um, it, it is not in the thousands of dollars, anything like that. It's probably closer to a smartphone than anything else. And again, the reason, you know, but eventually what really drives the price of this thing is the cost of the module itself. And, you know, those, those things range in price from, you know, ten, tens of dollars, you know, ten dollars to forty dollars or something like that. Well, that would really depend on the OEM that you go engage with uh, on that, and I, I really can't comment on that in terms of minimum quantities. But you can you can imagine if you if you you could do it like a hobbyist, where you know five devices is probably enough, but you don't get the economies of scale with that. Um, as were there any other questions? Okay. As far as the the cellular side of it, this particular chipset is a is a um, Multi-mode, what we call a multi-mode, so it'll, it'll work on on 3G networks as well as and fall back to GSM. Uh, so and then you know it, it's oh, um, it'll it, it'll work on this, this. Basically, these particular set of bands will take you through uh, Europe, the United States, and Japan. And uh, it, there, there are other other frequency bands that can always be reconfigured in the modem itself for other regions. But this pretty much covers most of the world. Uh, GPS, it's, it's got a standalone GPS and it's got a wireless LAN as well. In terms of the implementation, I won't really take any time on this, but because there's been a very nice talk on this so far, but I just wanted one thing that I wanted to point out is the JVM that this uh, Java ME sits on top of an extraction layer, which sits on top of the AMSS, and there was some discussion about 
what is the, the operating system. So that operating system in, in Qualcomm's case, it's, it's the, the modem subsystem. It's not a separate operating system like Linux or something like that. We internally call it Rex, but as far as the Java developers is, are, is concerned, that's completely irrelevant. You, you're not doing anything at that level. Everything that you need to do is completely accessible from, from Java. Uh, this is the same list of JSRs that was shown earlier. Well, one thing that's different, I think a couple of things. Well, the device access is not a standard JSR, so that's why I didn't list it up there. But I believe that's going to be standardized mm -hmm. uh, sometime soon. Uh, the AT command pass-through, I just wanted to briefly just touch on that. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with AT commands, if you go back, and this is something in the telephony space, but if you go back to remember to the old Hayes modem days, there was the AT commands that were sent by a computer to actually uh, configure the modem to do things to AT stands for attention to actually get its attention and then make a call and hang up a call, et cetera. So that, there's, there's been a lot of extensions to that since the old Hayes modem days by, in the cellular space. And um, generally, when, when you have a processor and a modem, the way they, they communicated with each other was using AT commands. And many of the, mo so what Qualcomm does is it provides a chipset to a module manufacturer like Centurion that was mentioned earlier, or Sierra Wireless or one of them. And then they create their own set of AT commands. And um, that might be very customized for something that very specific set of modem functionality that they want to implement. So we wanted to ensure that anything that was a custom AT command that allowed the modem to do something very specific was something that you could still do using this environment. AT commands are usually sent over a serial line to the modem. In this case, essentially, you could write that, take that same AT command, put it into uh, and access it via from Java directly to the modem. So it takes an AT command and sends it to the AT command processor in the modem from Java without having to go through the, uh, the serial interface. So that's something that is also available, uh, at least in, in the particular implementation that uh, Oracle did for Qualcomm. But um, eventually that will probably get standardized as well. Right? Yes, yeah, that, that's all I did, is you can write a Java call and put in, the, here's an AT command string and send it to the, to the modem from Java. And you can, you can probably, I can probably have a lot more details on that and mm -hmm. how the um, callbacks are set up so you can actually send a command out and then wait for a callback. Or you could register a callback on it and then when the command is done, it lets you know. So the WLAN API? Wireless. Oh, this, this is just an additional set of APIs that uh, are available on top of the standardized. Yeah. They eventually go down to the AMSS, yes. But uh, as far as, as a Java developer, that you, again, you really don't need to know where it's going within the AMSS. I don't know, what is it exactly called? Maybe if you had a specific example. The AT commands? The AT you? command, yeah. There's, there's basically just one command that you write with an AT command string. In there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's kind of a free text with uh, ability to do it either synchronously or asynchronously. Get notification. So, um, so the first uh, product we released, uh, three point two, uh, is there. It do not include the AT command. Of course, like we mentioned, we are keep going, uh, and we are going to add more peripherals. The AT commands is one of the very important ones in, in the space of uh, cellular modems, and we are going to have it uh, in, in one of the next releases. But in the meantime, it will be available on this platform as a non-standard. So, uh, so eventually, um, Eventually, everything will converge, and uh, device access APIs are going to be standardized and are going to run across all embedded platforms, including SE embedded. Yeah. How about the, uh, just like a general networking APIs, like, let's say, NTP, NTP, is it done directly? Yeah. So um, 
So FTP is, I think you can consider it as an application or, or a stack, it depends. So we, we do not provide FTP out of the box, so you would have to implement it off to, on top of the Java TCP IP stack. Of course, yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 no. The HT commands, um, so, you know, we, we talked It's a fallback. To, it's a fallback, yeah. exactly. It, it, if, if there was something very specific that the, the module manufacturer created, a very specific AT command that, for example, made a call, sent some data, and hung up, and, and, and they had one AT command that did that, and they just wanted to call that particular AT command again, this would allow you to do that. You could, the whole idea is you don't need that. You should not need it if you did your entire application development in Java in the first place. This is kind of that bridge that will allow people that were using AT commands in the past to continue to use them. Yeah, because there are like AT commands for instance, for FTP, that are Yeah. You have to socket before the FTP command. That's, that's exactly. The Java. You can get your device. Yeah, it's hooked up to the GPS, and you can get your location, uh, speed, and and whatever. Yes. There, there is a, a proprietary cell location API. Yes. It's not standardized today. So uh, mentioning few protocols for machine to machine, um, there are so many protocols, you know, that it's impossible to support all. Specifically, um, uh, SIPs, SAP, uh, we have a, a JSR written in Java, and you can just run it on the machine. It's supported, uh, so it's a good example. But of course, we cannot support all protocols. So. Uh, Potentially, you can implement additional protocols on top of TCP IP or whatever uh, media you select. Yeah, I think the other one you mentioned was JSON, and we were talking about that earlier. JSON, there is, yes. there, there's an open source version available that you could yeah. implement yourself on top of this. Yeah, specifically, this uh, demo of a web server using uh, an open source JSON parser, yes. So, so, yeah, so in this particular case, the, um, we have 128 megabytes available. And generally, if you, most of these modules, if I can go back to the module over here, you know, this, this is a module down here, right? This thing has, um, usually when, when the, um, the module manufacturers put these together, they, they put a significant amount of memory in there. And one of the reasons they do that is because, not because they just like to throw tons of memory in there, but the, the, the whole ecosystem and the environment that, that cell phones have gone through, cell phone, mobile industry is a very, very large volume industry. So just economies of scale have caused 128 megabyte memory to pretty much become the lowest point that you can get at, at a reasonable price point. The difference between a, a 128 and say, and even, even a 64 is pennies, if, any, if, if that. Right? So, so that's the reason we, we are kind of seeing that you generally will have enough memory. No. no, this is running ME. This, this one is running ME. But we, we are thinking what, you know, there's a possibility that we might even be able to run E on it. But the big difference is this particular modem right now, this modem does not support Linux. So E tends to require a little more. No, not E E prompt. No, no, it's, it's, it's a it's flash a RAM. memory. Flash memory. Yeah. Yeah. 
So yeah, so RMS is available, um, and we you have file file access, so you can implement any file access you like. And we are considering additional alternative, but currently RMS is available. Yes. What is this? Uh, okay, okay. So, so uh, Java provides the higher level APIs, the implementation, the actual implementation. If it's a FAT or or, or ZFS or whatever you have beneath it, it's out of the Java implementation. Okay, it's it's additional. Stack, which is abstract, it's not coming as part of the Java solution. It's the part of the device. Uh, so, so, so the de file system implementation comes with the device, uh, BSP, board support package, usually. Uh, sorry, it's what? Yeah. I think in the embedded space, though, for example, on our modern chipsets, again, we, we provide a particular file system that the base underlying OS, I mean, Rex in our case, supports. Now, um, can you go and change that? Uh, there are a lot of, well, there's some technical hurdles to that, but beyond that, there's some legal hurdles as well in terms of getting licensing to be able to actually go in and, and change that base operating system. Yes. 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 Yes, yes, yes. Okay. okay. All right. So I think I'm well beyond my allotted time. So I'll let you take Yeah, this is fine. Thank you. So th thank you very much. Yeah. It's, um, we are in testing right now, and we plan to have it available and general availability in the first quarter next year. Yes. Present. You will be able to get Java in any Chrome or so. Yeah. So same thing with the evaluation board. Uh, you buy the you know, stripped down evaluation board, and we give you everything you need to run Java. And I, I think that the idea here is that. Um, Oracle do not claim to do everything, right? We, we don't claim to implement uh, good devices. We have no idea how to create uh, uh, cellular chipsets, uh, etc. cetera. The, the idea here is uh, to partner with the industry leaders and come up with uh, uh, the best integrated solution. OK, so let's. Uh, Go on, and I think last thing we wanted to do. Um, so we saw that we can run the demo on uh, the emulator. Last thing we wanted to do is, is show you how it runs uh, on the board. So again, uh, um, we connected. The board is is running, and uh, all I have to do now is select. Instead of selecting the emulator platform, I want to select an external device. Which is the phone. And now, when I'm running now, once it's complete, it's installing the application on the device. Um, I think you can see we can open a telnet session into the board. You start getting the debug message from the board. Um, and next thing uh, we want to do is is sh make sure that Gonna, you want uh, to come and help me 
he wants to show you that um, okay now it loads so this is the same uh, user interface and let's see what happens now instead of playing with the uh, emulator we have real uh, buttons here and uh, if we press uh, the button um, it will show up uh, events are going and, and pulled I think every five or ten seconds by uh, the web server okay and same functionality like we had before logging and everything seamlessly working same application same binary it's not a, a java level compatibility it's a binary compatibility uh, between emulator and, and a device okay um any so the device itself oh, okay so it's a good it's a very good point let's go to the uh, log system so can you press uh, on the button again uh, you see immediately the log message appears so actually it, it's not pulling on on the device itself we get notified but the interface between the web server and the web page is done with polling because we don't have a push from the web server to the uh, web client right uh, it's out of you know it's uh, it's not in our <laughs> in our s uh, but uh, you know there, there, there actually there are protocols like and uh, now like a web socket uh, HTML5 WebSocket that gives you bidirectional interface and if you go for example to a session about uh, Java E7 uh, uh, I think it includes uh, frameworks and support for uh, WebSockets and uh, of course you can utilize that for notification for push notifications yeah In the, in the context of uh, SC Embedded or in the context of this uh, product? In the context of this pro uh, I, it's a bit uh, misleading maybe uh, because it's uh, about a specific implementation of this example web server. Uh, so um, theoretically we can extend it to support it, yeah. But it, it's an example, it's not part of the product itself. Yeah, so um, you want uh, to demo that? You know how we debug the system. So let's stop that and start the process again. Hmm? Yes. Let's connect again. And let's find a good place for a um, breakpoint. So let's have here a breakpoint in the tamper detection. So if someone press uh, a button, uh, I want my listener to be triggered. Um, okay, so let's start debugging. So it's running again. Um, you can see the log messages and it's in run mode. And now let's press the key. And uh, magically the debugger stopped. And I can, uh, for example, um, see and monitor the pin data structure that I just received. Please. A what, sorry? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's a very good point. So uh, it's, I think, two questions. How popular is Java ME in the M2M market? And then uh, power consumption related to Java. Um, so I think in the in Java, M2M is a, is a big, uh, uh, it's a buzzword, right? It covers um, uh, quite a big part of the embedded market. Um, so and I think until recently, Oracle didn't have a product for the smaller devices. Um, so I think that the Java for smaller embedded for smaller devices, uh, this is something that was not very popular. Uh, there, ha there are some implementations not from Oracle, uh, not very popular, but uh, this is exactly, you know, um, um, this is another uh, kind of a, a viewpoint that I, I can see the differences between Sun and Oracle. Uh, Oracle, when it goes to a specific market, it doesn't care unless you can be uh, one of the top three vendors. And if you ask someone else, the, the top vendor. So uh, uh, if Oracle decided to invest in embedded small devices, and specifically Java ME embedded, the idea is to be to make it very, very popular. Um, the opportunity with the Internet of Things, with the billion of devices which are going to be deployed, uh, is huge. And we are definitely not going to miss it. That's why we are working and building. So beyond good technology, you need to have partnerships uh, and build an ecosystem. That's why we invest in, in developer tools. That's why we uh, invest in partners. Um, so we're trying to build the full picture. Sorry? Yes. Yes, it's part. No. It's not a library. So, uh, so uh, uh, we just have here uh, uh, Terence is here is the product manager, um, and definitely we have we have um, we have the will and we have the plans to make uh, more samples uh, available to the developers. We we acknowledge that this is something which is required. Yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good, it's a very good point. So, um, so we've we've considered um, you know several alternatives when we selected uh, what is the technology we want to have as uh, Oracle official solution for the small embedded M2M, and and this is what we came up to. Uh, we we are taking the good stuff from uh, Sunspot when, for example, when we considered uh, which APIs we want to have for device access, we definitely work very closely with the Sunspot team. Um, when we improve, when we work on the underlying uh, layers, uh, we definitely work very close with them on how to optimize the footprint and things like that. So, um, so the bottom line is that our official VM for small embedded is the Java ME embedded, which is based on all our experience from uh, the phone market from Sunspot market and etc. Yeah, so um, so hopefully the presentation will be available soon together with the rest of the um, pre conference presentations. I encourage you to go and hear more. Uh, 
starting from uh, this presentation tomorrow morning given by Terence here. Um, another one talking about the future of Java, the next generations. Um, how we work with healthcare uh, institutes. Uh, there's a panel uh, with Continua. I think you can also see there a demo of Java working with Centurion module, end-to-end uh, -end demo standards based uh, based on continuous standards. So you have. And this is only example. There are most interesting sessions. Um, these are the URLs I promised into the Java product page, getting started guide, uh, developer forum URLs. So the, the minute uh, you know everything is all the all the presentation are published, uh, you will be able to um, get it more handy. Okay, thank you very much. If you have additional questions, we are here. Yeah. So CLDC is the successor of uh, KVM. Um, I'm not aware of any plans to revive KVM as uh, you know we already moved forward with CLDC. So, uh, like in the press release, uh, what I can say now is soon. <laughs> it will be available soon. Uh, I think the issues now, we, we are internally, it's released. We are now have to go through all the bureaucracy and process to uh, get it to you as well. The board itself is available today. It's, 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 a, uh, it's a board you can go today and buy from ARM resellers. Uh, but uh, to give you, you know, all the, the 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 image you need to flash on the board that has Java and everything, uh, this is the piece we are waiting for the final confirmations to be able to give it. Here. But everything is ready. Uh, just to press, pull the trigger when we get the approval to do it. Okay. Thanks a lot.